We've all heard the term net zero. People use it widely. What does it mean? Let's take a look. Um, imagine you've got a company here. That's my company. Through the things we do, either we make stuff or we travel to work or we ship stuff, etc., we generate carbon. That's through burning of fuel, electricity, gas, diesel fuel, etc. But that happens. And that's CO2 that's emitted goes into the atmosphere. Now, net zero says that we go through a process of three stages. First, we measure how much CO2 we're throwing into the atmosphere. Step two, we then reduce. So we put processes and programs and projects in place to reduce the amount of carbon that we are generating. Number three, we offset. Okay, and offsetting means that you can do things in, in this life where carbon is absorbed, okay? The general one, nine out of 10, you plant trees because the CO2 comes in from the atmosphere, is locked away in a tree in a form of wood, uh, and that gives you um, a way of, of absorbing CO2. And the idea of net zero is that imagine you've got a little sort of seesaw here, the, the amount of CO2 that is emitted by the things you do as a company, reduced down to the minimum, but the emitted is balanced equal and opposite by the trees that you plant. I'm gonna write trees, but because that's what it is generally, but um, it is absorbed down there. It can be other things, but is absorbed down there. And the idea of net zero is that that is in balance. That's net zero. Okay, so let's go into these things in a little bit more detail. Uh, probably over the course, if I get it right, of about five to six minutes, we'll see how I get on with that. So net zero, as I said, it, three main stages. Measure your carbon footprint, reduce your carbon footprint, and then offset what you can't reduce, kind of what's left. Let's have a look at measure, the first one, okay? So this is what you need to do in terms of measuring. This is what companies do. First, they set the scope. The scope is broadly what they're going to include and what they're not going to include. So you might want to say, for example, we are definitely going to put in electricity, gas, and company car fuel use. It would be unusual not to include those three. But what about everything else? What about, for example, commuting? Do you include it? Don't you include it? What about, for example, flights, business flights? Say, for example, you say, right, we've only got a tiny office, you know, we recycle everything, we're great. But then you go to New York every week for business, maybe you're not so great. So the scope here, very important to sort of think about when companies say they're net zero, yeah, okay, fine, but what are they including in the scope and what are they saying? Actually, we're not gonna be considering that at the moment. Makes a big difference, okay? Um, year, <laughs> you know, net zero, um, you know, are they talking about last year's net zero, year to date net zero, they're talking about the last 18 months net zero, which is linked to the baseline. So a lot of companies will say, we are going to reduce our carbon emissions by X compared to, and then you insert a baseline year. There's no rules, you can choose whatever you want. And of course, if you choose a year where the carbon use was exceptionally high, it makes your savings look better. So net zero um, baseline, again, important. Now look, here's, here's the reality of the situation estimates. Every single company I've ever um, sort of had the, the honor and the pleasure to work with has got incomplete data. So there is always something missing. Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's a little. But the more things you put in the scope, the more estimates are gonna to have to be made at the end of the day, because people, do you know what? They don't keep the records that they, th that they should keep, yeah? Uh, they didn't know this was coming. They didn't know that everybody was concentrating on net zero and things are getting better. So hats off to everybody in the company who's busy working to collect stuff. But uh, if you go back to the baseline year, did they have a <laughs> solid amount of data um, or do they have to estimate some? And as I say, in my experience, 100% of my clients have to estimate something. And I guess some more than others. Um, target year, I kind of wrapped it up into the measurement bit. It doesn't really fit anywhere else. But people often say, we're going to be net zero by, and then they choose a date in the future. Well, you know, that's the challenge in terms of, 
if you say to me, right, you're gonna be net zero by 2050, and I've seen stuff like that, well, that's such a long way away. <laughs> it's almost, you know, you could set plans now, no idea where they're gonna work in that time frame. You know, it's, it's, if you say net zero by 2030, maybe, you know, I'll buy that. Um, one of my clients isn't gonna be net zero by 2027. That is a good sort of starting point. 2030 is great. And if you just push that out much further, you know, sorry, my confidence in, in the fact that you're gonna do this just goes down and down and down and down. All right, so that's the measurement piece. Let's have a look at the next part now, um, uh, which is the reduction piece. Okay, second step in the process, reduce. Okay, so measure, we know what the, what the carbon footprint is um, in order to get to net zero. The next step is to actually reduce your carbon use. Um, challenge number one is there's no standard for what you must do. So a company could, for example, and some of my clients do, they say, we are going to replace our old style lights with new style LEDs. We are therefore reducing our carbon footprint, we're great. Well, that's good, it's good, it's not a bad thing, but you kind of be doing that anyway. You know, if you tried buying old lights these days, they're less and less in fashion, everybody's moving to LEDs. So, you know, they could claim they're going down the net zero route, so could another company that's doing a whole long list of, of really quite serious projects. So there's no standard measure. There's nothing saying, right, if you do this, 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 you can call yourself net zero, and if you don't, you can't. That's not the case, okay? It's a complete wild west. There's no fixed rules and, and guidelines out there. Um, we've got a set that we use internally, um, I'm pleased to say, and they tend to work quite well. But the whole reduction piece, you know, is not specified. So the question is often, what sorts of projects are you gonna do? Um, are you going to look at simple, low cost, no cost projects, such as LED light replacements? Or are you gonna up the ante and start saying, right, well that old boiler, that old heating system, we're gonna replace it. You move, for example, from gas or oil into electricity, you know, with, with heat pump technology. Very good, very worthwhile. But are you gonna go down that route? Because that requires more budget than just swapping the lights out, okay? Similarly, are you gonna start saying to people, you know, make sure that one in five trips you do is done um, over Zoom, i.e. you don't do that fifth trip, you do the first four, that fifth one is Zoom, yeah? What sort of rules and regs are you gonna put in place? What sort of projects are you going to sort of instigate to reduce it down? And the question is always, how much are you gonna reduce it by? So there is one really good standard, SBT, which says you should reduce your carbon use in line with the 1.5% global heat, um, the global warming um, limit that they've set. So it doesn't really say you've got to reduce by 2%, 4%, 10% a year. It instead says, look, you've got to keep your emissions in line with the science at the time, in line with the 1.5% limit that we're going to try and impose on the, the Earth's global temperature increase. But how much are you gonna reduce it by? And again, if you go big enough and link back to budget, if all you're gonna do is swap the LED lights out, hmm, question, you know, just how much reduction have you done? Um, the last one on here, who polices it? You know, we are net zero, we save a lot of carbon, we're gonna be carbon, uh, carbon neutral or net zero by 2030. Broadly speaking, says who? You know, I, I've seen that so many times. And who's checking it? Who's putting these things in place to say, look, you know, <laughs> you're 10% off your target, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a public company, you know, one of the sort of larger Fortune 500 companies that, that we've got the pleasure to deal with, you know, a lot of this stuff is done by teams and done by sort of groups of, of very interested analysts who will look at it very closely. But generally, you know, who is checking it? The company's making statements. What backup, what verification do they have that those statements are correct, okay? So that's net zero, stage two, reduction. As you can see, is it worth doing? Hell yeah, 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 we, we need to. This is the stuff that we need to do to limit the global warming that's going on. Is it fraught with, with complexity? Yes, it is. So that's the reduction piece. Offset, last bit. Um, let's have a chat about offsetting. Okay, so the third component of net zero is offsetting. We've measured, we've done what we can to reduce. 
what do we do now with that chunk of carbon that we, we just, we're going to admit it's as low as it possibly can. You know, you've got a business to operate. You're going to need to do some things and they're going to emit carbon. What do we do to get rid of that, that bit? You brought it down as low as possible. How do we get rid of it? Well, the answer is either you or you pay someone else to lock the carbon in. So it's carbon that, that you would absorb from the atmosphere, lock it in somehow, and then make sure that carbon stays locked in and it's not re-released into the atmosphere. The easiest, <laughs> simplest way of doing that, the most popular by a long shot, is planting trees. So every time a tree grows a bit, it sucks in CO2, and it, in terms of wood, generates a little bit extra wood, and that wood contains a lot of carbon sucked out of the atmosphere. So you can do it yourself. You can pay someone on carbon offsetting schemes to do that for you. Typical rates at the moment are, it's between about 13 pounds up to about 20 pounds per ton um, of CO2 that you want to sort of offset and pay someone else to, for example, plant trees. It can go as high as 40 or 50 pounds depending on what scheme you use, okay? It doesn't have to be trees. You can also do, for example, I've seen solar ovens for developing countries that've got a lot of sunlight. It's typically Africa, Central Africa, where um, instead of actually using wood fires, they put in big parabolic mirrors to actually focus the sun's rays down and cook that way, much cleaner. Um, some people would like to be green, can't afford it. So again, green grants to help smaller companies afford this sort of stuff will enable them to you know, improve their systems, maybe their heating or their lighting around the place. Okay, now, which country are you gonna do it in? And you have to be a bit careful because the idea about this is, is you do it yourself or you pay for someone to do it, but just be careful because some countries have got schemes in place already. Uh, and what's on my mind specifically is India, where they had a scheme of planting a billion trees. Brilliant scheme, really good. Well done, India, fantastic. They were gonna do that anyway whether or not your company or you contributed towards the cost of the project. So if you did, you don't have a material effect. And that's what I look for in offsetting schemes is materiality. So just make sure that the money you put in has a direct influence, a direct impact on uh, carbon absorption through the atmosphere. Um, who issues the certificates? So normally with these schemes here, they say, look, we're going to do this, 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 and we're going to issue a certificate that actually proves that. Who issues the certificate? Be careful, you know. Uh, there are some uh, dishonest traders out there who will maybe plant a few hectares of trees and sell that carbon reduction to the same people, uh, sorry, to different people for the same trees. So just watch out for schemes like this. Take a look at who issues the certificates. Make sure they're reputable. Uh, it's tied up with scams. The last bit is, what do you want to offset? So let's just imagine you've been in existence for, your company's been in existence for 100 years. Then let's imagine you've got a, a growth of, of activity during that, starting small, building up to quite large. Do you look to offset each year your annual CO2 footprint? Or, again, a couple of my clients, brilliant, hats off to them, have taken the decision to actually not just do their annual, but to do 10% over that so they can start chipping away at all of the carbon they've generated since the company um, came into existence. Okay, brilliant, well done, hats off to them. So look, that's net zero um, in three simple steps. First, you measure your carbon dioxide emissions. Step two, you reduce them down to as low as you possibly can. Step three, what's left, you offset either yourself or you pay someone else to plant trees on your behalf to lock in the carbon. That's net zero, that's what it means. Um, I hope you found that useful. If you did and you like what we're doing, please click subscribe below. It genuinely helps us uh, and uh, there's other videos in this series to kind of help you through this topic.